when the Reformation threatened the power of the Catholic Church and drew millions of people away from its clutches, Satan established a counter-Reformation designed to nullify the threat and reassert its position of dominance. At the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, a commission of cardinals was put together to clean up the Catholic Church and to reassert its position of authority as the only true Church of God. Fundamental to this movement was the establishment of new religious orders. The most famous order to be created at this time, and the one that has gone on to become the largest in the world, was the Society of Jesus, or as they are more commonly known, the Jesuits. They would become one of the most infamous organisations in history. It's important we explore the Jesuits because it gives us deep insight into the mind and tactics of our enemy, but for that same reason I want to preface it with a warning that the next few parts will be dealing with some very twisted and evil themes. The founder of the Jesuits was a man called Don Inigo Lopez, who was born into an extremely wealthy family in the Basque region of Spain in 1491. He later changed his name to Ignatius Loyola. As a young man, Loyola was said by police records to be proud, violent, vindictive and dangerous. His great life's ambition was to become a powerful military commander, which was going well until one particular battle where a cannonball broke one of his legs and heavily wounded the other. This event effectively ended his military ambitions. He was removed from the field of battle, underwent numerous painful surgical operations and spent a long time in recovery. During this period, Loyola had a nervous breakdown as he struggled to come to terms with the end of his army career and the end of his life's ambition. In this fragile mental state, as he lay there with little else to occupy his mind, he began reading a number of fanciful religious texts about the works of the Catholic saints. Particularly inspired by the life of St Francis of Assisi, he set out to emulate his deeds and those of others like him. He began to envision Jesus as a type of great military commander, and thought that although his physical army career was over, he could instead become a kind of general in Jesus' army instead, the goal of which would be to capture the world. Now as a cripple, he made his way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat, where there was a Benedictine monastery. Within this monastery was a sacred goddess idol called the Black Virgin of Montserrat, which he stood before in vigil for three days. There he committed himself and his work to her. By doing so, he committed himself to the demonic goddess Asherah. From here, he decided that he would go to Jerusalem and conquer the Muslim world for Catholicism. His ambitions were halted, however, as Barcelona had the plague and he was forced to stay in the small town of Manresa for ten months instead. For those ten months, he lived in a cave, torturing himself physically and mentally until he began to have dreams and visions. Through these hallucinations, he claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him by a form in the air near him, and this form gave him much consolation because it was exceedingly beautiful. It somehow seemed to have the shape of a serpent and had many things that shone like eyes, but were not eyes. He received much delight and consolation from gazing upon this object, but when the object vanished, he became disconsolate. Here we see the telltale signs of a demonic cave revelation, exactly like that which Muhammad experienced. More explicitly than Muhammad's encounter, the being came in the form of a serpent rather than an angel of light. Similar to Muhammad, Loyola found himself prone to depression after contact. After the ten-month period in the cave, Loyola proceeded to Jerusalem, where he approached the Franciscan monks. They told him to go home as they did not want any political trouble. It was upon his return to Spain that he started formal training by studying theology at various universities. At this time, he, along with a small band of companions, also started making disciples of others. While Loyola preached, it was noted that some of his female followers became so hysterically zealous that one fell senseless, another sometimes rolled about on the ground, another had been seen in the grip of convulsions or shuddering and sweating in anguish. Clearly demonic activity was at work following his cave experience and commitment to the demonic Asherah idol, and for the rest of his life he was known for having mystic powers. In the coming years he would be thrown into jail twice under the suspicion that he was a member of the Almbrado, or as we know them, the Illuminati, and we'll discover more about them later. The description of people falling senseless and going into convulsions may remind you of scenes from Christian churches in recent times. 
To deal with that, I want to refer you to a three-part series called Kundalini Warning, which I'll provide links for below. Please watch all the way to the end for a balanced opinion. By 1534, Ignatius Loyola had six key companions, all of whom he had met at university, and they formed the initial military brotherhood of the Society of Jesus. On the morning of 15th of August, 1534, they met in the crypt of the Church of Our Lady of the Martyrs at Montmartre and took solemn vows committing themselves to their lifelong work. As a man with an army background, Loyola created his order with the principles and disciplines that he had been used to as a soldier. The leader demanded the unquestioning obedience from his inferiors. Loyola was made the first superior general of the order and they began the work of opposing the Reformation and re-establishing the dominance of the Catholic Church in Europe and around the world. They made their way to Rome where, in time, their society was accepted by the Pope, who at that time was Paul III. Paul III had seen the need of such a military order to repel the progress that the Protestant Reformation was making, as the Catholic Church seemed powerless by its own means. The Pope invested in them the authority too. Excommunicate all who would hinder or who do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach and administer the sacraments, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgences, to live exempt, free from secular powers, taxes as well as jurisdiction, authority sentence and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge magistrate from any search. In other words, the Jesuits were given authority from the Catholic Church to operate above the law and to employ any means necessary to do their work. With this remit, in time, the Jesuits became the most prominent and powerful of Catholic weapons against the Reformation. Key to Ignatius Loyola's order were something called the Spiritual Exercises. These were based on the experiences and secret teachings he had received whilst in the cave at Manresa. He basically made a template of what he had done in the cave to summon the serpent with the secret knowledge and then passed it on to his followers. These spiritual exercises formed the foundation of his entire movement. All Jesuits would have to go through them in order to bring themselves to the same kind of mind as Loyola had himself after ten months in the cave. They involve systematic meditation, prayer, contemplation, visualization and illumination and would lead to a trance-like state of ecstasy. By following these rituals, he and his followers were even seen to levitate off the floor. The spiritual exercises initiation would take 30 days and initiates were brought through them by a supervisor or director. For the entirety of that period they were told what to think, how to feel, when to groan, what to sigh, what to imagine, and they were to cut off all normal human emotion throughout those experiences. By the end of the 30 days the initiate was to have his mind broken like that of a horse, so that he was now ready to be utterly obedient in all things. An observer of the Jesuits wrote, not only visions were prearranged, but also sights, inhalings, breathing was noted down, the pauses and intervals of silence were written down like a music sheet, which meant that the man, being inspired or not, became a machine who had to sigh, sob, groan, cry, shout, or catch his breath at the exact moment and in the order which experience showed to be the most profitable. Using this method, Loyola needed only 30 days to break someone's will and reasoning. The Jesuit initiates, once brainwashed or programmed by the spiritual exercises and further training, were to become as puppets to their superiors. Their constitution states that the Jesuit must give instant compliance to those above them in the hierarchy, completely sacrificing their own will in the process. They were to be directed under divine providence by their superiors, just as if they were a corpse, which allows itself to be moved and handled in any way. Their constitution justifies this absolute and unquestioning obedience by claiming the general of the Jesuits is in the place of Jesus Christ. Like the Pope, the general has invested in himself spiritual authority for worldly power and control. In more than 500 places in the Jesuit constitution, it is taught that the Jesuits should see Jesus in their general.
The blasphemy continues in the Constitution, saying, No Constitution, declaration, or any order of living can involve an obligation to commit sin, mortal or venial, unless the superior command it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, or by virtue of holy obedience, which shall be done in those cases or persons wherein it shall be judged to conduce the particular good of each, or to the general advantage. And instead of the fear of offence, let the love and desire of all perfection succeed, that greater glory of Christ, our Creator and Lord, may follow. That nonsense just means that the Jesuit superiors can command an inferior to commit a sin in the name of Jesus Christ if they feel the end justifies the means, or if it leads to the greater glory of God in their eyes. Loyola even said, I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it. The order operated on the basis of complete blind mechanical obedience to those who are higher up in the hierarchical structure. The entire organization in turn would be at the disposal of the Pope as an army of the most zealous and dedicated spiritual warriors for the Vatican. They specialized in warfare by stealth and deception to undermine the enemy, the enemy being true Christians of the Reformation. We gain the fullest understanding of their deceitfully wicked intentions if we read their oath, and so we'll go through that in the next part. But before we leave the spiritual exercises, another warning against deception. Paul wrote to Timothy that towards the end of time, people would begin to abandon the faith and instead follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Here are the words of popular American pastor Tony Campolo in his letter called Becoming Actualized Christians. I learned about this way of having a born-again experience from reading Catholic mystics, especially the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius, a founder of the Jesuit order, was once a soldier, and it was only when he spent a long time in a hospital bed recovering from a battle wound that his heart and mind focused on God. Like most Catholic mystics, he developed an intense desire to experience a oneness with God. Gradually, he came to feel an intense yearning for the kind of spiritual purity that he believed would enable him to experience the fullness of God's presence within. Tony Campolo goes on to say, After the Reformation, we Protestants left behind much that was troubling about Roman Catholicism of the 15th century. I am convinced we left too much behind. The methods of praying employed by the likes of Ignatius have become precious to me. With the help of some Catholic saints, my prayer life has deepened. We know that behind the Catholic saints are demons, and we know that the spiritual exercises are satanic. Beware the emergent church movement in particular, which we'll look at later in some depth. Satan is trying to sneak his poison into Christianity, and this is why it's so important we study this stuff so that we're not led astray through lack of knowledge, and so that we learn to recognize deception and evil, even when it comes disguised as an angel of light through the lips of people who claim to be on God's side. We're now going to read the Jesuit Oath to gain an insight into exactly how they went about trying to destroy the work of the Reformation. When I warned that we'd be going into some twisted and disturbing stuff, this is one of the things I had in mind. It's an extremely disturbing document, but it's important to go over it, as it doesn't just give us insight into the Jesuits. By proxy, it gives us deep insight into the mind of our demonic enemy as a whole, and the tactics that Satan may still employ today against us. Remember, he has no new tricks. Incidentally, I'll post a copy of this in the notes section of the Fuel Project Facebook page if you want to read it again. My son, you have been taught to act the dissembler, amongst the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic, and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants, generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to speak from their pulpits, and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew amongst the Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. 
You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace, and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, and enjoying the blessings of peace. To take side with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that in the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, amongst the schools and universities, in parliament and legislatures, and in the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors, for none can command here who has not consecrated his labours with the blood of the heretic, for without the shedding of blood no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise that, and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all Protestants and liberals as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honour, rank, dignity or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. By reading these words we gain a full appreciation of their shocking tactics, which can be summed up like this. Their intention was to become part of the faith, system, culture or group that they intended to destroy. Then from within they would sow seeds of hate and division. Their method was to present themselves as one thing on the surface, but to be secretly working away with each other for a very different purpose behind the scenes. They would sometimes pretend to be enemies on opposing sides in public, but behind the scenes they were actually cohorts, working together towards the same goal. This type of attack is sometimes referred to as becoming a fifth column, meaning that the most effective way to attack something is not from the north or the south or the east or the west, but from within. Cicero once said, A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not traitor, he speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation, he works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a city, he infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. The fifth column tactic is of course a trademark of Satan. It was the very tactic he used to persuade a third of the angels to fall with him and to become his army of demons. He went around whispering in the ears of anyone who would listen to turn them against God. More recently, ex-witches have spoken of being assigned to local churches by their coven with the aim of being involved in the congregation on the surface but all the while secretly working against it from within, frustrating its aims and unity. If something is attacked from without, it will put up its defences and fight back, 
But if, by using deceit, the attacker can become part of the thing it wishes to destroy and gains the trust of those involved, they can take it down from within. But could we really expect any human being to carry out the acts described in this monstrous Jesuit oath? Well, remember that the spiritual exercises were designed to eliminate all human emotion and to turn the men into machines. And just as demonic influence was so clearly at work in Loyola's cave experience, so they are involved in the spiritual exercises. H. Bomer in Les Jesuits writes, We imbue unto him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface, sometimes after years of not even mentioning them, and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulse. In other words, through the spiritual exercises, the Jesuit initiate becomes possessed and finds themselves compelled to act according to the will of these demonic forces within. Because Jesuit actions are centred on blind obedience to their superiors, they are told that they will never be held accountable for anything they do, not even by God. They are absolved of all personal responsibility as they become mere puppets for those that are higher up in the hierarchy. A professor told a student who was studying under him to become a Catholic priest, You will never have to give an account to God for actions you do by the order of your legitimate superiors. If they were to deceive you, being themselves deceived, they alone would be responsible for the error you have committed. Your sin would be imputed to you as long as you follow the golden rule that is a base for all Christian philosophy and perfection, humility and obedience. See how deceitful this is. The superiors are basically saying, you'll never have to give an account of your actions to God, don't worry about it. This allows them to perpetrate any act in the belief that they are beyond judgment. If their superior tells them to carry out a murder, they think that if they obey, then God will not hold them accountable and will instead blame the superior. This is one method the hierarchy uses to overcome or bypass the conscience of an individual. When you combine this with the spiritual exercises that have taught them to suppress human emotion and imbued them with demons, you can see how they would become capable of some extreme acts of violence and anything else for that matter. A second vital principle for Jesuits can be summed up in the phrase, the end justifies the means. Remember this one, it's very important. Before this maxim, the ideas of absolute right and wrong completely vanish. Conceivably, there is no crime or atrocity that is not allowed as long as it is for the greater glory of God. In fact, the sins that achieve the right result become holy in the eyes of the Jesuit, no matter how disgusting. You can lie, cheat, steal, rape or murder, but if the ends are the right ones in their eyes, then the means are justified. This exact concept also exists in Islam, where lying, deception, murder and other atrocities become acceptable if it furthers the cause of Allah on the earth. A third twisted principle of the Jesuits is probabilism. If a Jesuit has in mind to do something but knows it is very probably illegal, if he can find the merest hint that it may not be, he is allowed to continue with his action. For example, if he consults 100 teachers or doctors about his intended action and 99 say that it would be unlawful, but then one tells him that it may not be, he can act on that 1% probability that it is in fact lawful. In fact, if the Jesuit can imagine any reason in his own mind why his action may not be unlawful, however unlikely, this frees him to do it. It's a form of self-deception, lying to yourself to try to keep the conscience clear. Fourthly, there is the idea of directing the intention. This is the idea that if the person meditates on something holy while they perpetrate something evil, the soul contracts no guilt or stain. Therefore, the Jesuit can kill someone or lie or cheat or steal, but as long as he is focusing on something holy at the time in his mind, their soul remains white as snow. Again, such is the depth of deceit within the Jesuit system that they deceive even themselves. Fifthly and finally, there is the doctrine of equivocation or mental reservation. 
This policy allows the Jesuits to follow a secret policy while stating something completely different to the outside world. This is directly from the mysteries where secret doctrines and purposes were hidden under double meanings and secret symbols that seem quite innocent to the uninitiated. A Jesuit quoted, It is permitted to use ambiguous terms, leading people to understand them in a different sense from that in which we understand them. A man may swear that he never did something, though he actually did, meaning within himself that he did not do so on such a day, or before he was born, or under any circumstances, while the words he employs may have no such sense as would discover his meaning. He goes on to say, It is the intention that determines the quality of the action, and one may avoid falsehood if, after saying or denying something aloud, then add something under his breath that, if true, would make his statement the truth. So take this example. A Jesuit murders a man on a Thursday and the police take him in for questioning and ask him if he murdered the man in question. The Jesuit replies, I did not murder him, which is obviously a lie because he did. But then under his breath or mentally, he adds the words on Friday. These inaudible words that he whispered to himself after the initial lie have now made the statement true. By doing this, Jesuits can permit perjury and in their own eyes remain blameless. The Jesuits expanded quickly around Europe. One of the primary ways in which they went about reclaiming some of the ground that had been lost to the Protestant reformers was to establish schools of education in various locations. They went for control of the information flows imagining, quite rightly, that by controlling education they could control knowledge and therefore control the worldviews and mindsets of coming generations. If you go to the Jesuit Boston College website today, you'll see a part where they admit When in 1547 Ignatius was asked to open a school in Sicily for young men who were not Jesuits, he seems to have seen the opportunity as a powerful means of forming the mind and the soul. To bring people to God, he sought to form those who, in their turn, would form or influence many others. These schools that catered for children of all ages soon spread across the world as part of a covert campaign to turn people back to Rome. The key to it was that unlike other Catholic institutions, the Jesuit schools actively encouraged Protestant children to enrol. This tactic gave them an opportunity to indoctrinate future generations with the rites, ceremonies and symbols of Rome. They particularly wanted to target the children of rich and influential Protestant families because they knew that what was taught to them would have a trickle-down effect on the rest of society. Like Jezebel herself, the Jezebel spirit goes for the powerful man who will influence others. Jesuits also sent missionaries to far-flung places in the world like China, placing great emphasis on the importance of assimilating themselves into their culture. By educating themselves on the language and religion of these places, they could become teachers of the people and work their way into positions of influence. They were incredibly committed, hard-working and disciplined in these tasks, pouring out their lives for the furtherance of their cause. Wherever they went, they consistently compromised their own message with the local pagan practices of the area to get a foothold, just like they'd done in Rome itself. When they returned to Europe from these far-flung places, they brought back with them the occult and pagan ideas that they'd picked up there. In Britain, the Jesuits made use of fifth-column tactics. They started filtering into the country in the 1560s, and almost immediately they were found preaching from pulpits disguised as Church of England ministers. In 1568, a Jesuit priest posing as a Church of England minister accidentally dropped a secret copy of instructions on how to undermine and destroy the Church of England. After a search of his lodgings, further documents were discovered in his boots, including a license from the Jesuits and a bull from the Pope Pius, which authorised him to preach whatever was necessary to inflame animosities and widen divisions. They saw no better way to demolish churches than to infiltrate it in the guise of a minister who could introduce divisive false doctrines and ceremonies from the pulpit. The Jesuits also plotted to kill Queen Elizabeth I on many occasions so that the country could be returned to Rome. The Spanish Armada of 1588 was one such attempt to sail against Britain and overthrow the Queen who was seen as heretical and illegitimate by Rome. 
the Spanish Armada was defeated, but true to the Jesuit oath, that which could not be achieved in the open was pursued in secret. After Elizabeth I died and James I took to the throne, Jesuits attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605, the infamous November the 5th gunpowder plot led by Guy Fawkes, an event we celebrate in Britain every year. There were also murmurings and suspicions that the Jesuits were responsible for the Great Fire of London in 1666, although there seems to be little hard and fast evidence to support the theory. There was simply a mysterious book written in 1667 by a man claiming to be a Catholic Christian, in which he portrayed the Pope as fanning the flames that ravaged the city. In truth, the Jesuits were largely frustrated in Britain, but they did have more success in Europe. Having established themselves in Italy, Spain, Portugal and Austria, they set their sights on Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation. There they gained influence with the rulers and initiated campaigns of persecution against Christians. In keeping with their oath to stir up division and bloodshed in countries that were previously enjoying peace and prosperity for the sake of the Catholic Church, this persecution of Christians led to much disruption, war and bloodshed around Europe. They reignited the persecution against Protestants in Germany, leading to the Thirty Years' War of 1618. Although Protestant Sweden stepped in to stop Germany from being returned to Catholic darkness, it left the country in ruins for a long time afterwards. In the neighbouring Austro-Hungarian Empire, Jesuits were so influential that they virtually controlled the emperor at the time. Having this power, they came pretty close to purging the region of true Christianity. In Poland, which was a major European power in the mid-16th century due to their embracing of the Reformation, Jesuits also became enormously influential. This influence led to a decline in national well-being and disastrous policies towards neighbours that eventually led to their annihilation. Entry into France was slower, but was achieved by the formation of educational institutions. Jesuits were implicated in the assassination of the French King Henry III in 1589 and his successor, Henry IV, in 1610. They believed it was their right to kill any heretical monarch. They took the initials INRI, which biblically represented the Roman inscription above Jesus' head on the cross, meaning Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and gave it a double hidden meaning which meant it is just to annihilate impious rulers. If you read their oath, you'll know that they paid no respect to rank or position. The French king, Louis XIV, was more to the Jesuits liking, though. Louis had a Jesuit confessor from childhood whose influence turned him into a fanatical bigot, unleashing terrible persecution against Protestants. Louis also led an immoral life, and the Jesuit confessor made careful use of his secrets to have him trembling at his feet for forgiveness. This was a common tactic by Catholic priests generally, to use the confessional booth to gain access to secrets that could be used for blackmail later. Knowledge is power. By 1685, the situation was severe enough for hundreds of thousands of French citizens to flee for their lives to remote areas, and those that stayed behind faced terrible punishment. This was in fact replicated all across Europe, where true Christians had to flee to communities in remote areas to avoid persecution from Rome. Some of these examples are recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. As the Jesuits continued to rise to power and influence in Europe, they also accumulated vast amounts of wealth and property. However, their scandalous greed, their loose morals, their ceaseless political meddling and their encroaching upon the clergy had stirred up enmity and hatred everywhere they had been, and this would lead to their downfall. Amongst the higher classes in particular, the Jesuits had been brought into complete disrepute. Governments began to realise that this single group were the source of nearly all the disruption in their lands. In fact, so severe was their cancerous activity that the Jesuits had become a threat to the very fabric of society. Nations could stand it no longer, and the Jesuits were systematically driven out from previously friendly Romanist countries during the period of 1760 to 1770. Although the Pope at that time, Clement XIII, still supported the Jesuits, the nations of Europe ramped up the pressure on him to take drastic action. The French government were particularly fierce in their protests against the Jesuits, saying in 1762, The said institute is inadmissible in any civilised state, as its nature is hostile to all spiritual and temporal authority. 
it seeks to introduce into the church and states, under the plausible veil of a religious institute, not an order truly desirous to spread evangelical perfection, but rather a political body working untiringly at usurping all authority by all kinds of indirect, secret and devious means. The doctrine of Jesuits is perverse, a destroyer of all religious and honest principles, insulting to Christian morals, pernicious to civil society, hostile to the rights of the nation, the royal power, and even the security of the sovereigns and obedience of their subjects, suitable to stir up the greatest disturbances in the states, conceive and maintain the worst kind of corruption in men's hearts. Notice the very distinctive Jezebel or Asherah characteristics of the organisation described here, the hostility towards all authority, the attempts to usurp it using manipulation and secret means, the desire to claim all authority for themselves. And remember that this shouldn't surprise us as Loyola spent three days dedicating himself and his order to her in the form of the Black Virgin of Montserrat. With her at the spiritual helm, it of course displayed her characteristics. The pressure on the Pope became too much to ignore, and so eventually he reluctantly called a secret conclave in 1769 to bring into effect the suppression of the Jesuits. Mysteriously, he died the evening before the meeting could be held. It was strongly suspected, of course, that the Jesuits had been the perpetrators of the murder. The next Pope, Clement XIV, tried to reform the Jesuits to no avail, and after further pressure from the monarchs of Europe, he finally abolished them in 1773. A year later, he was dead by poisoning, with the Jesuits again at the top of the suspected list. At that point, the Jesuits were forced to secularise themselves, and on the surface at least, they disappeared from society, except in Russia where they were allowed to continue as normal. The Russians wanted to use their skills to subdue the recently conquered Polish people. In return for their help, the Russians would give the Jesuits refuge. Since it was the Jesuits who were largely responsible for the weakening and destruction of Poland in the first place, the people of Poland have more reason than most to feel animosity towards the order. With the Jesuit order more or less finished as an effective religious weapon though, Satan needed to change tack in his continued war against Jews and Christians. This change occurred in the Age of the Enlightenment. <laughs>